Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. Police in Brown and Bartholomew counties are investigating a rash of break-ins at area churches. As Brad Davis reports, they think the crimes could be connected. Over the past six months, police say vandals broke into at least six churches across the two southern Indiana counties. Like I said, there used to be a cross that hung here. Ohio Chapel United Methodist Church in Columbus is among the churches vandalizers hit. It sustained the most damage. Pretty shocked trying to figure out who would want to do this and why. And so, I mean, you can hurt the church, but you're not going to hurt the people because the people is what make up the church. After breaking into Ohio Chapel, police say the intruders broke out several windows, turned crosses upside down, and even attempted to set the church ablaze in the basement, although the fire extinguished itself. They also broke mirrors in the bathroom, shoved a cross into a toilet, and attempted to set a Bible on fire. Bartholomew County Police are also investigating damage at Triumphant Baptist and White Creek Methodist. Brown County Police say the same person could likely be behind acts of vandalism there, where someone damaged Way of Holiness Tabernacle, Pikes Peak Church of Christ, and St. Agnes Catholic Church. After about the second to third one, we knew pretty quickly that they were connected. St. Agnes Catholic Church behind me is one of three churches that were broken into in Brown County. And similar to the church break-ins in Bartholomew County, they found an upside-down cross and a broken window. However, no damage was actually done to the church, and it was all done to the youth barn and the parish office right up the street from here. Deputies in both counties are increasing patrols and security checks at local churches and have asked community members to watch for any suspicious activity. And while the break-in at Ohio Chapel was particularly jarring, Patrons are choosing to respond with understanding rather than hatred. And a lot of us feel that, you know, we need to pray for those individuals too. We need to pray for our church for one, but I know we'll, we'll survive. We're, we're tough. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Brad Davis. 3D printing technology is revolutionizing the medical field. The technology has had an impact on countless industries, but there are few areas where it shows more potential than medicine. Lindsay Wright joins us now. Thanks, Joe. In a lot of cases, medical devices have to be custom made. That makes them expensive, and it can take a long time for them to be produced. Look at prosthetic limbs. According to a recent NewsHour report, one in 2,000 kids is born with some kind of arm or hand abnormality, but most of them don't have prosthetics because it's a big investment for something the child will quickly outgrow. 3D printers have the potential to make medical devices cheaper and faster than ever. In many ways, Violet Hall is an average nine-year-old. Goofy, smart, artistic. I have one. Go ahead, absolutely. Beautiful. <laughs> You're so modest. Modest, but very humble. Uh... But there's something that makes Violet unique. She was born without her right hand or forearm. She's used prosthetics before, but she outgrows them quickly. They can also be clunky, bulky, and expensive. But this prototype? is different. John Rasick made it in the Mad Lab at Indiana University using a 3D printer. Rasick is a senior lecturer of design at IU. Here's his explanation of how 3D printing works. Um, it's just a series of slices uh, and you can control uh, that resolution. Um, you can control how, um, how thick, how solid the pieces are. Uh, so if you were printing a cup, you would print, you would, uh, print a circle and then the bed would drop um, you know, by millimeters or less than millimeter, uh, and then you'd print another circle, and then it would just keep going and keep going and keep going until you had a physical object. After attending an Indiana University Science Fest, Millette Hall posted on Facebook inquiring about 3D printing. She wondered whether someone could print a prosthetic hand custom fit for Violet. Rasick saw the post and responded, but it wasn't a chance encounter that brought the Halls and Rasick together. Rasick's daughters and Violet played on a sports team together and it never even came up. <laughs> so it's just amazing that someone in our own backyard basically can help us out. It took about six months for Rasick to make two prototypes and the final arm. He printed the arm in a series of parts and then used what's essentially fishing line to hold it all together. And the way it works is as when she uh, bends her elbow, it moves the fingers. That's Again, it's not perfect, but you can get the sense of how it works. Still working out some, some kinks, maybe, or? Mm -hmm. 
It's yeah. very noisy. Noisy. <laughs> and I'm supposed to work on that, and I just haven't had the chance. The big plus for the Hall family, it was also affordable. The prosthetic cost only $35 to print. You know, part of the, the, the motivation behind this whole movement was uh, prosthetics are very expensive, and they're very expensive for kids, and kids grow, obviously. So this allows you to, to as the kids grow, you can reprint the arm uh, to fit them. 3D printers are a game changer across the medical field, not just with prosthetic arms. So this is a side view of the knee. This is the femur. Here's the tibia. Dr. Todd Midla is one of the few orthopedic surgeons in the state and the only one in Indianapolis offering 3D printed knee replacements. Midla says traditional knee replacements are based on a size scale. That's why 3D technology makes more sense to him. And when that prosthesis is made, it's made to fit that patient only and nobody else. Midler recommends 3D replacements for most of his patients. That's a pretty dramatic shift considering he only began using the technology within the last two years. But he's noticed faster recovery times and more satisfied patients. Across the country, doctors are using 3D printers to make skin, synthetic organs, heart valves, and medical devices. But Midla acknowledges some doctors are apprehensive about using the technology because it's still relatively new. There's not a lot of research. I think as they see the data and patients coming in wanting it, they're, they're going to be forced to at least look at it. Working with Violet is one of RASIC's first forays into medically related printing. For Violet's project, she had some interest in uh, playing violin. And so what I'm working on now is an attachment that will attach to, the, to the, her hand that will allow her to hold a violin bow. Looking into the future, he sees incredible potential for 3D technology. I think the way to proceed is you get a lot of people at the table. You get, a lot, you get doctors, you get nurses, uh, you get medical uh, administrators, people who run hospitals, you get designers, you get fabricators all at the table discussing these problems. And, and with all that input, you're going to get good solutions that, that actually work. Rasik is also taking his work with 3D printing international with several projects. He's working on a crutch design, and he's even working on another prosthetic arm for a little girl in Uganda. Worldwide interest in 3D printing is really gaining momentum. A recent report projects the 3D bioprinting industry will reach a value of $1.8 billion by 2027. Joe? Wow. Thank you very much, yeah, Lindsay. You're welcome.